so you're you're saying that notwithstanding the the locations, then so there are some postal locations that are protected that are outside of the rural Canada. Um, Bottom line, can you just share the findings of that analysis and then provide the committee with a copy so that we understand how that yeah. plays out? Yeah, we, we can share that. We, we, can, we can commit to that. Thank you. Mr. Sousa. Thank you, Mr. Sousa. Um, Mr. Bryson, Mr. Yee, thank you for joining us today. We'll look forward to having uh, President Ediger in sometime in May. Colleagues, we're going to suspend for about four minutes so we can bring in our new witnesses. Uh, Mr. Bryson, Mr. Yee, you're dismissed. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon, we are back in session. Uh, gentlemen, uh, welcome back to OGO. Uh, I understand you're making an uh, opening statement. Colleagues, please. We are in session, colleagues. Please go ahead with your opening statement for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, good morning. 
Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg peoples. Thank you for inviting us here today as representatives of Public Services and Procurement Canada to discuss the important topic of postal service in Canada's rural and remote communities. Joining me today is Mr. Eugene Gorwich, who is the Director of Performance and Impact Analysis in our portfolio team. Mr. Chair, before we delve into today's topic, allow me to provide the committee with an overview of the relationship between the Department, the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, and Canada Post. Même si Post Canada relève du portefeuille du while it is part of the Minister of Public Services and Procurement's portfolio, Canada Post is a federal crown corporation and operates at arm's length from the government. The Open and Accountable Government document, published in 2015, provides us with a framework for portfolio management in the Government of Canada, and it identifies the roles and responsibilities of ministers and their departments. This framework clearly sets out the importance of respecting the operational independence of Crown corporations while ensuring that their overall direction and policies align with those of the government. In the case of Canada Post, the Canada Post Corporation Act grants its board of directors the responsibility of directing and managing all affairs and duties of the corporation. The board consists of the president, and CEO, and 10 other members, all of whom are appointed by the Governor and Council. Mr. Chair, the Board is responsible for overseeing Canada Post, exercising due diligence over strategic initiatives and corporate plans, and managing services and operational performance. Responsibility for day-to-day -day operations is vested in Canada Post CEO, who is accountable to the Board for the overall management and performance of the Crown Corporation. <coughs> Services and Procurement is accountable for providing guidance and oversight to ensure that the overall direction of Canada Post aligns with the government's policies and objectives. When it comes to reporting, Canada Post provides details of their operations and performance in their annual reports, which are tabled in Parliament by the Minister. Mr. Chair, Canada Post's mandate is to serve every Canadian address while maintaining financial self-sustainability. As is the case with other postal carriers around the world, Canada Post is evolving to meet the changing customer needs and expectations. We know that Canada Post has been experiencing financial challenges, challenges as a result of declining mail volumes for some time. The corporation continues to explore opportunities to improve the financial sustainability of its operations. As for the study at hand, the moratorium on the closure of rural post offices has been in place since 1994 and has remained unchanged despite shifts in the country's demographics. The Canadian Postal Service Charter clearly states that ensuring postal services in rural settings remains an integral part of Canada Post's commitment to universal service, and the Charter maintains the 1994 rural moratorium. Mr. Chair, as stated in the Minister's mandate letter, the government expects Canada Post to provide high-quality service at a reasonable price and that better reaches Canadians in rural and remote areas. This includes meeting the provisions laid out in its charter. Canada Post reports to the government on its performance against its charter commitments within its annual reports. Although the moratorium protects rural post offices from closure, it should be noted that there are situations that can arise that affect the ongoing operations of any post office. These situations can include personnel retirement, <coughs> illness, or fire, for example, and when they happen, Canada Post is responsible for consulting with the community to find solutions so that they can continue to provide quality services. Mr. Le Président, comme je... Mr. Chair, as I've stated, Canada Post operates at arm's length from the government and is ultimately accountable for the conduct of its affairs. Nonetheless, PSPC supports the Minister to ensure the Crown Corporation's direction reflects government policy objectives and advises the Minister on matters under his responsibility and authority. While the Department does not have direct authority over Crown Corporations, we do play a role in promoting appropriate policy coordination and building coherence in the activities and reportings of the corporations. I would be pleased to answer questions this Committee may have on the role of Public Services and Procurement Canada in relation to Canada Post. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Genos, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm going to turn things over to my colleague uh, in a moment, but I have a notice of motion that I want to share with the committee prior to doing that. Uh, Canadians have been shocked by the Arrive Scam scandal 
uh, Globe and Mail reports uh, over the weekend uh, dig further into another shocking aspect of this scandal, uh, and that is the apparent rampant abuse of uh, the Indigenous procurement set aside uh, in ways that do not benefit Indigenous peoples or communities. Uh, the Globe and Mail highlighted how various Indigenous leaders have raised significant concern uh, about uh, these abuses, uh, and and yet uh, a, there has been a lack of action. Uh, recognizing the need to get to the bottom of how dollars that should have been benefiting Indigenous communities across Canada uh, were actually flowing to a small number of well-connected insiders, I'd like to propose. Uh, uh, I'd like to put on notice uh, the following motion, which which uh, we'll then be discussing at a later date. The motion is that pursuant to Standing Orders 108.1 two and three C, a subcommittee on government operations and indigenous reconciliation be established to inquire into matters relating to indigenous procurement policies, as well as other aspects of the committee's mandate, which the committee may refer from time to time relating to indigenous reconciliation, provided that A, the subcommittee be composed of seven members, of which three shall be from the government party, two shall be from the official opposition, one from the Bloc Québécois, and one from the New Democratic Party, to be named by the whips, informing the clerk of committee with the first members named within one week of the adoption of this motion. B, the subcommittee be chaired by a member representing the official opposition to be chosen by the subcommittee. C, the subcommittee shall have the same powers of the committee, except the power to report directly to the House, the power to sit during a time when the committee uh, is sitting in Ottawa, and the power to sit on days when the House is sitting. And D, when the subcommittee adopts any report, it shall be deemed to have been adopted by the committee. Dissenting or supplementary opinions shall be filed within seven days of the adoption of the report unless the subcommittee provides for a longer amount of time and the chair of the committee shall be instructed to present it to the House on behalf of the committee. And E, the chair of the subcommittee may, if not already a member, attend meetings of the subcommittee on agenda and procedure in a non-voting capacity. Thank you, Chair. I'll turn uh, my time over to Ms. Block. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. In the 2021 mandate letter for the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, the Prime Minister tasked the Minister with ensuring that Canada Post provides high-quality service at a reasonable price for rural Canadians. You yourself made note of that in your opening comments. He also stated that the Minister of Rural Economic Development would assist uh, PSPC in this matter. Are you aware of any discussions, conversations, or assistance from the Minister of Rural Economic Development or their department uh, that has been made available to PSPC for improving Canada Post's service to rural Canada? Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. While I can't speak to um, the ministerial level, at the um, officials level, we have been having conversations with a number of other departments and agencies, uh, including colleagues from rural area to be able to explore options that may be available in terms of um, or generating ideas that might be considered by Canada Post uh, in terms of uh, moving forward dealing with some of the challenges that have been discussed uh, during today's appearance. Okay, thank you. Um, you also uh, mentioned the act under which Canada Post operates and the mandate to provide postal services to all Canadians in a secure and financially self-sustaining manner. Um, one of the representatives uh, from Canada Post themselves uh, made the observation that oftentimes the need to provide uh, secure and uh, a quality postal service often is hard to do when you they have to remain within their means. Therefore, Canada Post is running at a deficit. Can you um, provide me with any sort of an indication as to what plans have been put in place to ensure that an effective postal service continues or will resume in rural Canada um, while maintaining a, uh, a viable postal service to Canadians? Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. Um, 
so two things that I would say on uh, in this regard. First is, of course, um, Canada Post as uh, an independent crown corporation and one of the largest organizations within Canada with nearly 70,000 employees from coast to coast to coast um, maintains and, and obviously they are the specialists in the area of uh, how they manage their, their own operations. As was indicated by the Canada Post reps this morning, they have a, a number of activities that they undertake, including the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, and obviously, as was noted, um, there are nonetheless challenges associated with that, which you know, uh, my conversations with Canada Post have noted that in when you're dealing with that many employees when in, you know, more than nearly 5,600 locations, there's bound to be some challenges that that will that will accrue. Um, the second thing is, is with regards to um, activities, Canada Post is obviously always looking to be able to find ways to be able to uh, maintain its financial uh, self sustainability. Uh, they are a crown corporation that with very with one small exception, well, one exception of $22.6 million. I don't want to make it sound like that's not a lot of money, uh, but um, uh, they are they um, only finance their activities through um, costs that, sorry, uh, revenues that they generate. Apologize. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Outland, go ahead, please, for uh, six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our officials for being with us today. Um, according to the Minister of Public Services and Procurement's 2023 Transition Binder, the Minister provides Canada Post with guidance and oversight to ensure that the overall direction and performance of the corporation aligns with the government's policies and objectives. And this is normally communicated via an annual letter of expectation. What were the major issues communicated in the Minister's latest letter of expectation to Canada Post? And what, if any, anything, did this letter of expectation convey on the subject of service to rural and remote areas? Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the, uh, for the question. Um, so the letter of expectation is provided on an annual basis by the minister to um, heads of crown corporate or any minister to he heads of crown corporations within their portfolio. With regards to Canada Post, uh, the letter of expectation identified a number of activities, sorry, of expectations. And I would say that expectations fall kind of within a couple of different categories, if you'll permit. Uh, first is, uh, for all crown corporations, there's expectations of certain things that are usually issued by the um, Privy Council Office or, or government writ large. Uh, and then with regards to Canada Post, obviously there was focus on uh, a number of activities, including those that were for, uh, mentioned in the Minister's mandate letter. So uh, making sure that they're um, financially self-sustainable, that they provide universal services, uh, and so on. And can you highlight anything specific around rural and remote areas? I can add. Oh, sorry. Uh, am I good? Yes. Uh, the the letter specifically uh, indicated that uh, Canada Post was expected to to continue to meet the expectations of the service charter, and that it was the role of the board of directors to hold management to account to that effect. Okay. I'm I'm a rural New Brunswicker, so this is certainly an issue that uh, is important to me. Um, according to the Minister of Public Services and Procurement's transition binder again, the department is working closely with Canada Post to examine opportunities to improve the financial sustainability of its important operations. So what actions is the department considering to improve Canada Post's financial sustainability? Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. So again, the department has undertaken a number of activities, including, as I mentioned before, speaking with other departments and agencies in terms of whether there may, may be opportunities for synergies, for example, of activities between Canada Post and other federal organizations, uh, as well as kind of encouraging Canada Post to be able to look at um, alternative activities when it comes to um, maintaining financial uh, viability. Um, as was noted by Canada Post representatives in the past, uh, when they appeared, um, their primary raison d'etre is to be able to deliver letter mail. Letter mail has been in decline since 2006 uh, with fairly important and significant um, reductions in, in letter mail as, as Canadians use uh, send letters less and less. Um, as was noted, they are um, spending, uh, putting more of a focus on the parcel delivery uh, side of it for obvious reasons, because that is uh, seen as a bit of a growing market. Uh, so we've been working with Canada Post to try to um, provide some ideas or suggestions and work with them in terms of uh, potential uh, way forward. Great, thank you. Um, and are you familiar with um, the community hubs model for Canada Post? And so um, we, I noticed that there was a newer one in Member 2 Nova Scotia. It was particularly uh, interesting for me because it's uh, with, an, with an Indigenous community. Um, so there's things like parcel lockers, EV charging, financial services with an ATM on site, check cashing. Do you know of any plans to expand the community hubs um, throughout Canada? Perhaps this could actually address some of the concerns we have for rural communities. 
Thank you, Mr. President, for the question. So um, community hubs, uh, Canada Post undertook a number of them on a pilot basis uh, in order to be able to see kind of, um, one, whether they bring benefits to the local communities, uh, including uh, Indigenous communities, uh, and two, also to be able to test out their um, their business model in terms of what are the costs of being able to operate uh, these, act, uh, these hubs and whether um, they provide a different level of um, revenue or return on investment than what a, a traditional post office would be. I know that, that analysis continues to be ongoing, so I don't know whether there's been a decision in terms of going forward, uh, but it is something that Canada Post has been, uh, that has been exploring. Great. Um, I'm also interested in, a, in a, a question that was asked in the previous panel with regards to, um, you know, property portfolios and, and kind of, our, you know, the potential for maybe addressing housing concerns or other issues in community. So what is Canada Post doing to optimize its real property portfolio and, and how is PSBC supporting them in this work? Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. So obviously um, the issue of housing is one that um, I think has, has uh, generate a lot of attention and within that context uh, all federal departments and agencies are looking to see what they can do to be able to uh, help advance uh, housing. Uh, in that context um, we have been having conversations with Canada Post to see whether or not there may be opportunities um, in terms of some of their um, their portfolio in terms of whether that could be leveraged for housing. Recognizing of course that Canada Post um, is an operational organization in nature uh, a lot of the um, facilities that they have they will continue to need going forward in terms of things like uh, sorting facilities and, and, and so on, um, and that a lot of locations are for um, actual um, uh, postal offices. Um, so while there's a question in terms of how much of that could be leveraged for housing, I think it's probably a um, good exercise to be able to review uh, from a Canada Post perspective whether there's opportunities to do so. If, it, if there is, without having a significant impact in terms of the number of locations that there are, uh, or the spread of the locations, um, of course, that could also um, potentially reduce its, uh, its footprint, which may have uh, cost implications. Great, thank you. I think I have one more question, enough, for, enough time for one. Uh, when discussing the future of Canada Post, are there international comparisons we can look to when it comes to revitalizing a national postal service or improving rural postal service in particular? Yeah, like 20 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So in the 16 seconds that are left, we, we do take a look at uh, the top 12 or 15 co uh, other comparable countries. Uh, they are all, their local, their post offices are all facing the same challenges as Canada Post, so we're learning from them. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Vignola for six, please. Merci, uh, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our witnesses today. Mr. Gorovich, I believe... You were the one who responded to a question put my my colleague about the letter of expectation and what it contained. You said that the government expects Canada Post to meet all the charter expectations. So we're talking about the Postal Service uh, Protocol. Now that dates back to 2018 and it was supposed to be reassessed in 2023. Now, unless I have lost uh, some of my intellectual abilities, I could not find this new protocol or assessment. When will it come out, please? Thank you very much for the question, Chair. The protocol that you are referring to is reviewed every five years and over the past year, we have reviewed this protocol. The review continues. And uh, as you n noted, perhaps during some of Canada Post's answers, this protocol hasn't changed since 2009. And so the services that need to provide obviously uh, have not changed but have been modified in ways, yes. There are expectations in terms of obligations and delivery. However, that uh, sustainability is not there. You said earlier that in order to improve financial self-sustainability, uh, some measures had been put in place, but we don't have the list of those measures, and that there had to be a certain synergy of services throughout Canada. Uh, there also have to be more services and attempts to improve profitability. So do you have a more specific list on how you're going to or how self um, sustainability, financial self-sustainability is going to be ensured? 
the only amount that Canada Post receives from the government is that $22 million, which is basically the cost of our free parliamentary mail and the fact that any constituent can write, write their MP uh, without having to pay for it. So there's $22 million approximately that covers that cost. However, we all know that Canada Post has to be modernized. But in order to be able to do that, money is required. But Canada Post is posting a loss. So it can't modernize. And if it doesn't modernize, it can't make any money. So we're, it's really chasing its own tail. So does the government not have a role to play in order to be able to support and sustain this Crown Corporation? so that it's sustainable and modern, even if that m implies uh, f financial support in order to support that modernization that will help make it sustainable? Thank you very much for the question. So to your first question about uh, the activities in more detail, I would say two things. I need to respect the independence of Canada Post. They mentioned that there will be their annual report coming out over the next three weeks. And in that report, you will see information on the activities they're undertaken and on their financial situation. In terms of your second question, yes, there are those $22 million out of uh, $7 billion, actually. Uh, now, does the organization need money? Well, as a Crown Corporation, the government will provide support where, for example, those corporations are not able to uh, support themselves. However, what kinds of options are there to ensure that self-sustainability, given the current model? There are costs associated with making deliveries throughout the country. And obviously that will have to be taken into consideration to determine the path forward. Well, modernization is important and it would help ensure, for example, this security and safety in certain areas. Earlier I mentioned, for example, Kujuat and Blanc Sablon, where medication has to be able to arrive on time. And some areas are rural, or they aren't necessarily remote, but there are duplicate addresses and postal codes, which means that that type of security is not assured. They don't receive their medication on time, for example. It would be unfortunate if these committees decided to, for example, take legal action because they are not getting what the protocols and legislation require. How can you ensure that this won't happen and that people are safe? Thank you very much for the question. 20 seconds then. Well, the Board of Directors have that responsibility to ensure that the organization is compliant with the expectations in place. And that's a part of the conversations we'll be having with Canada Post going forward. Mr. Backrack, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for being with us. Um, does monitoring the effectiveness of the 1994 moratorium on post office's closures uh, fall within the, the mandate of Public Services and Procurement Canada? Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. So the um, the... Adherence to the rural moratorium is part of the service charter, and uh, Canada Post provides updates uh, in terms of its compliance with the service charter uh, on an annual basis to uh, the minister through its annual reports. And in that regard, uh, my team and I take a look at the annual report and, um, you know, provide a secondary sec secondary view um, uh, for consideration by the minister. So, so you do monitor. This is a government mandate. And you're the government, and you monitor whether Canada Post, as an arm's length corporation, is fulfilling the mandate. I take that as your answer. H how many post offices have closed since the 1994 uh, moratorium was put in place? Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. Uh, so there's been a sent. Go ahead. Uh, so when the moratorium was established, there was roughly 4,000 protected offices. 
Uh, today, there are roughly 3,400. 3,400. So 600 post offices have closed since. From that list of 4,000, we've lost 600 post offices. Over 30 years. OK. And does PSPC or the government in general see this as being a problem? Like, there's a moratorium on closing post offices, and yet we've seen a significant percentage of the protected list closed. How, has the minister, you know, provided any direction to Canada Post to um, to reverse this trend? It feels like the moratorium isn't working. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, I would say that uh, on an annual basis, um, roughly 125 offices um, come up for, for review, and uh, out of that, only a small number are, are closed. So, in 99 percent plus of situations, the moratorium is is maintained. Um, but absolutely, uh, we take your point that, that the number of offices has, has continued to decline, um, as letter mail does continue to decline as well. So, so here, here's my observation as someone who represents rural and remote communities. You have Canada Post post offices in rural areas. Something happens to the post office. Uh, the postmaster quits. Postmaster passes away. The building burns down. Uh, Canada Post's offer to new postmasters is, uh, frankly, not adequate to attract uh, new people to the role. And so at, when they don't get any applicants, uh, they end up contracting out the service. Uh, so the retail franchise model, they get a business, they pay the business a commission on parcels. And when that fails, because the commission that Canada Post pays isn't adequate, uh, the community ends up with a steel mailbox on the side of the road. Does that ring true? Is that what we're seeing in rural Canada right now? Thank you. So um, thank you, Mr. President, for the, the question. Recognizing that rural Canada over the last 30 years has changed fairly importantly, one of the things that was noted was that some communities that were rural 30 years ago are no longer. Gatineau is actually still on the list as a rural community. I don't know that many would consider Gatineau to be rural. So I think it's, it's difficult to paint a, a brush across for all of them. What I, what I would say is this. Um, there are certain instances where because of demographic shifts, there are going to be closures and there are going to be openings that will obviously kind of align in terms of as Canadians continue to move throughout the country, um, that those would, would be um, okay. Where there's issues obviously is where in certain locations um, uh, there's still a need for it and that the replacement is challenging. If I could, we're talking about 600 post offices and I'm trying to understand the trend. Mm -hmm. Those 600 post offices are not in communities that are, you know, urbanized. Like, what we're seeing is the loss of post offices in tiny communities. I know we are. Like, you know we are, right? This is the trend that we're seeing across Canada. And the question is, like, that's clearly contrary to Canada Post's mandate to provide better service in rural communities and remote communities. And so we have a situation where the government's mandate is, is not being fulfilled by the corporation. Like, is that not the case? We, 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 the government tells Canada Post you need to improve and deliver high quality uh, postal service in rural and remote Canada, and Canada Post operates in such a way that we lose 600 post offices since 1994, and rural Canada is losing postal service every single year. How, how is that not a problem? Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. So um, obviously that is a challenge in terms of the number of post offices, including from the moratorium, that have, have closed, as you indicated, 600 over the course of the last uh, three years. So as part of that, those, those are the things that are kind of explored um, through um, our conversations with Canada Post in terms of raising those as, as challenges and, and areas that they need to be able to um, focus their attention on in terms of making sure that they're maintaining service to, uh, to rural Canadians. Um, depending on how much time I have left, sir. 45 seconds. Okay, so very quickly, for um, ministers of the Crown, there are a number of options that are available to them in terms of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, their, their dialogues in terms of um, um, Crown corporations. We talked about the letter of expectations as being one. Uh, the other one as well is, you know, obviously just uh, encouragement, which is what we do within PSPC when we speak with Canada Post. Uh, and then again, you know, making sure that the board of directors is aware of their obligations um, and making in terms of um, service delivery. So to be, to be very clear, has the minister ever, in the letter of expectation, expressed to Canada Post any concern about the closure of rural post offices, this loss of 600 post offices, and said, as minister, I want Canada Post 
to do things differently to prevent this, to, to reverse this trend of losing post offices. You mentioned the letter of expectation, but uh, what you read back to us from the letter of expectation was boilerplate. It was, you know, continue to fulfill the service mandate, blah, blah, blah. Has the minister ever expressed concern that the moratorium is not being heeded by the Crown Corporation? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, in the brief time that I have left, um, the letter of expectation sets the expectations in terms of the board. Uh, so obviously, typically tends to have language which is fairly, you know, uh, strategic or, or policy in, uh, in nature. Thank you very much. Mrs. Cousy, please, for five. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Uh, in the previous hour, we were uh, able to obtain executives here from Canada Post. Unfortunately, we did not have the CEO of Canada Post today. Um, we look forward to their testimony at a later date. Um, but in this first hour, I questioned the Vice President of Operations relative to a May 2023 report on the invasion of privacy of Canadians uh, their privacy of Canadians not being respected. In this May 2023 report of the Privacy Commissioner, he indicated that information from mail was being harvested from Canadians and then rented to third party organizations for the profit of Canada Post. Now, uh, Canada Post, in their initial response, indicated that they did not view their engagement in, in these activities as being any way contrary to the public good. In fact, they said, research indicates that consumers enjoy receiving this information um, by mail. Well, I do not believe that Canadians appreciate having their privacy uh, rights taken away from them. So... Essentially, Canada Post refused and rejected this report of and recommendation of the Privacy Commissioner. Now, today, the Vice President of Operations indicated that there were some uh, remedial measures being taken, evaluation of postal codes, etc. Uh, first of all, I would like to know, do you condone the privacy of Canadians being compromised in this fashion? Secondly, are you aware of these mitigatory steps that the Vice President of Operations of Canada Post says that ha have been taken? And third, do you think that's satisfactory to respect and protect the privacy of Canadians? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, for the question. Um, so in terms of uh, the issue of privacy, obviously the Privacy Commissioner has issued a report to uh, Canada Post that highlighted um, concerns and highlighted recommendations uh, in terms of uh, whether, and as was indicated today, um, Canada Post has undertaken activities and steps to be able to address the recommendations of the Privacy Commissioner. In terms of whether or not those are satisfactory, that would be for the Privacy Commissioner to be able to determine whether the recommendations and the steps that have been taken by Canada Post will address the concerns that were raised uh, in, the, in that report. I just wanted to add uh, that in the annual letter of expectations issued to Canada Post, uh, the expectation to meet the, uh, the recommendations from the Privacy Commissioner were also included. Excellent. So then you're saying you do respect the decisions made by independent officers of Parliament. Absolutely. Excellent. Another issue that we have seen this committee seized with is the issue of bait and switch in the Arrive Can scandal, uh, Arrive Scam, as it's now commonly known. Uh, in this, in this uh, process, what happens is that a, a contractor, a vendor, enters with a certain proposal using certain subcontractors, certain other partner vendors, and then when the contract is awarded, it switches out the vendor, switches out the, the agreements on which the contract was awarded. What analysis has your department done to avoid the bait and switch uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. In terms of work with Canada Post on issues of their contracting activities? I'm talking across government. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, unfortunately, I was prepared to speak with about Canada Post today. Uh, um, so while I know the department has undertaken a number of activities in the area of um, procurement, and, and uh, I don't know that I would be um, well-positioned to be able to provide an informed response. 
In your role in public works, would you say that there is a culture of non-compliance with contractors and subcontractors uh, because of the overly relaxed attitude of the department <coughs> to accept bait and, and switch? Uh, I think that falls within the realm of what we're talking about today, the general culture of, of the department, relative not only to Canada Post, but to your, your department itself. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. With regards to my role as the Assistant Deputy Minister for Policy Planning and Communications, uh, what I would say is what I've observed being with the department since 2018 is that it is a department that, um, you know, is, is aware of the fact that there are a number of obligations and requirements in terms of um, not just procurement, but a number of other areas. We've talked about privacy and others, uh, and undertakes uh, to the best of its abilities um, the work in a way that is compliant with all those uh, rules, directives, regulations, laws. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mrs. Cousy. Mr. Baines, please go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to our department officials for joining us today. Um, uh, I wanted to um, ask uh, Mr. Rachi, um, considering you're in planning and communications, and you, we've spoken about the annual letter um, that's shared with PSPC, do you think that's sufficient, uh, considering the rapid uh, changes in letter mail and, and how mail is uh, delivered? Is, is the annual letter sufficient, or is there any more periodic... Uh, uh, communication that's happening between uh, Canada Post and and, and uh, PSPC. Thank you, Mr. President, for the uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the uh, for the question. Uh, so, response in two parts. Part one is um, so again recognizing that Canada Post is uh, one of the largest organizations in Canada with nearly seventy thousand employees uh, across fifty six hundred locations from coast to coast to coast. Um, we do have regular um, touch points and, and meetings with them. Um, on a bi-weekly basis or sometimes even on a weekly basis to be able to discuss um, the numerous issues um, and opportunities that Canada Post um, is facing. The second point is to your first question, you talked about the letter of expectations. Um, that is one of the uh, tools that is used by uh, ministers to be able to, um, as I mentioned before, to be able to identify expectations of Crown Corporations. That's not unique to Canada Post. That's across all Crown Corporations. Um, and there are other mechanisms that are also used Last thing that I will say, if you'll permit, is um, we noted very briefly before that a number of other jurisdictions, um, when we when we explore them or when we look at them, are facing similar challenges that, that Canada Post is facing, um, whether it's in the United States, in Australia, in England, France, so on and so forth. Um, there is a decline in letter mail that's happening across the board, and a lot of postal, all postal uh, services, um, basically around the world, are facing similar challenges to uh, decreasing letter mail which results in decreasing revenues with increasing number of points at which they have to be able to deliver, um, which raises some fundamental concerns. Many other jurisdictions have taken the route of um, providing financial assistance to their uh, postal services or postal carriers. Uh, some of the other organizations or are, are, some of the other jurisdictions, pardon me, are doing um, a few things that are a little bit different. And for, for members as part of the study that might be of interest, might want to be interested in uh, what the, the Australia uh, are doing with uh, their postal system. Well, con considering that you're aware of the recent trends in letter mail, you're looking at other uh, jurisdictions. What are you learning from them? So apart from the fact that understanding that they are having similar challenges, what are you learning and what's a good model? You just mentioned Australia. What, what, are, they, what are they doing? So, and, and it's a, it's a comparable, it's a pretty vast, uh, you know, um, uh, country in a region, hard to get to certain areas similar to what we have here. So two things, and then I'll turn to my colleague, uh, Eugene, in just a second. Um, so I think from a, uh, what we're learning perspective is, particularly when we take a look at the Australian model, and as you indicated, there are a lot of comparables between Australia and Canada in terms of geography and some of the challenges that that, and some of the opportunities that that arises. Um, I think what we're finding is, is that it's, it's actually a fairly complex um, issue that often brings a lot of different um, factors into consideration in terms of things like universality, um, making sure that everybody in the country is, is treated the same in terms of service delivery. Uh, that has implications in terms of um, cost, in terms of um, there's, you know, simply some places might be a little bit easier uh, to be able to deliver, which usually means that it's a little bit less costly to be able to do so. So what I would say is, as the committee looks at this subject, um, there's a fair amount of um, complexity in terms of some of these um, issues that I think, um, you know, we're, 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 we're learning about. Eugene? Yeah, well, I, what I'll add is that uh, posts across the world were provided an exclusive privilege, a monopoly to deliver letter mail, and as letter mail continues to decline, 
that source of funding um, will be insufficient to, to maintain the universal service that exists today. So as, as post transition from a, a message-based delivery system to one that's focused on goods, on logistics, on, on parcels, um, we need to ask ourselves as a government, um, what does universal service mean today? Um, many other countries are moving to things like alternate day delivery of letter mail, um, while others, like Lorenzo mentioned, have, have decided to subsidize um, their national posts. So out of the um, roughly 192 member countries of the Universal Postal Union, which is the UN technical agency for the post, more than half today um, provide subsidies to their posts in one way or another um, to ensure that they can maintain the universal service. I know it was mentioned earlier. I, I'm, I fortunately live in a very, in a, uh, Richmond, British Columbia, Gateway City. A lot of access, a lot of logistics there. Um, but we have a community hub model there actually for parcel delivery um, where the Canada Post Office is inside Canadian Tire. And it's commonly lined up. People are using it. It seems to be uh, working pretty well. So, like, is that is that working? Is that community hub model working? I'm afraid we don't have time for a response, but maybe we can put that in writing. And I think Ms. Appen had uh, broached that as well. Uh, Mrs. Vignola, please, for two and a half minutes. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Chair. Mr. Yerachi, you said in your opening remarks that PSPC provided advice as well as uh, oversight. Now, in terms of advice, has any of that dealt with, for example, outsourcing, contracting out, for example, or have you not gone as far as that in your advice? Thank you very much, uh, Chair, for the question. With respect to the daily operations of Canada Post, they are responsible for that. And I would add that Canada Post, as a Crown Corporation, and in relation to supply, given that they follow fall under the Act, is not subject to all the Treasury Board, for example, policies, they are independent or at arm's length in terms of their activities. Thank you. Well, we are obviously reading each other's minds because uh, I was looking at what has been written about Australia, for example, and you, the UK in terms of their postal services. Uh, and their delays. Uh, some are uh, suffering delays up to four months, for example, in the UK. And in Scandinavia, it takes less than two weeks to receive their parcel, a parcel sent from here. And that's, that's excellent. That's even faster than within Quebec. Sometimes when I send something to my sister, it takes more than two weeks. So definitely more can be done. Now, in terms of PSPC, do you, or in collaboration with Canada Post, do any more in-depth studies? Because I have the impression that everyone's going through the same thing. Fine. However, I'm getting the impression also that that's an excuse not to move forward. And it's unfortunate because perhaps what, we should, what should be said is, right, there's a problem. Yes, there are solutions. Yes, it will cost more money. But it's going to be worth it in the uh, long term. So is there that kind of thinking going on right now? Thank you very much for the question. In 15 seconds, I would say, as I mentioned, Canada Post has about 70,000 employees. We have, about, we have about 12 in our team, and we're responsible for these uh, Crown Corporations. Canada Post isn't the only one. So obviously we do the work that we can in terms of identifying ideas and potential solutions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'd like to pick up where I left off with the loss of rural post offices and this trend that we're seeing where post offices go from Canada Post post offices to a contracted out service to a, a mailbox on the side of the road. And I was talking to uh, Carmen McPhee. She's the chief counselor of uh, the Taltan Band, one of the, the bands of the Taltan Nation up in northern BC. And some years ago, Canada Post contracted out uh, the post office in Dees Lake to the Taltan Band. And they've been running it as a service to the community. Um, it's not working out because the amount that Canada Post is willing to pay through that contract 
is not enough to cover the cost of operating the post office. And so the band is losing tens of thousands of dollars per year. And when I talked to Chief McPhee, um, her desire was for Canada Post to take it back and to reestablish a proper Canada Post post office in that community. Now, based on your knowledge, when you look across Canada and you see the loss of all these post offices, are we seeing any examples where contracted out services, these uh, retail franchises, um, go back to the Canada Post post office model with a unionized postmaster and the costs covered by Canada Post. Is that something that we're seeing? Is there a mechanism um, to return full services to communities where the contracted out model isn't working? Or is this sort of a one-way trip to a community mailbox on the side of the road at minus 40 with two feet of snow and uh, no way to buy stamps? What's your message for Chief McPhee? Thank you, Mr. President. For uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. Um, so, two things. First is to answer your direct question in terms of whether the contracted out model, whether we're seeing a uh, kind of the the flow go the other way. I don't have the answer to that question. As I indicated, Canada Post, as an independent crown, kind of manages its own operations. Um, I would say that in a lot of instances, there are so recognizing that the situation that you've described in Dees Lake is going to be very different from a lot of other franchise locations. In other instances, what Canada Post will do is there are times when they will set up a franchise location. Somebody mentioned a Walmart or a Shoppers Drug Mart, one of those retail places. Um, again, recognizing that in some communities that will not work for obvious reasons, but in a number of others that, that does tend to work. And um, Canadians have indicated through public opinion research that whether it's a corporate location or a franchise location, they just want to be able to have access to the service. It's and which is why I said There's no shopper uh, strike mark. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. That is our time. Uh, Mrs. Block, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I want to revisit the Charter or the Canada Post Corporation Act and, and second and the second provision. The provision of postal services to rural regions of the country is an integral part of Canada Post's universal service. So if it's an integral part of Canada Post Universal Service and it is actually identified in the Act as being so, I want to go back to this whole conversation we've had around the moratoriums. Earlier in this meeting, we heard from Mr. Yee who stated that if a post office is on the list, it won't be closed. And you yourself, Mr. Gorovich, um, stated that the moratorium has remained unchanged. And I have to believe that what you meant was the language of the moratorium, not necessarily the fact that we continue to see closures in rural Canada. So my question to you is, um, in regards to the moratorium, and as my colleague has pointed out, whether um, Canada Post is unable to find a retail space to host a post office, or a postmaster passes away, or or leaves that post and you are unable to find a replacement, it would appear that the closing of post offices by attrition is a way for the Government of Canada to subvert the moratorium. Is there any, um, are there any actions being taken by your department to ensure that that gap within the moratorium is closed? Mr. Chair, for the question. So again, as we indicated, we we do work with Canada Post, and we do um, basically point out to them or, or flag to them every time we become aware of a situation where uh, a rural post office or location is at risk. Um, again, keeping in mind that the Crown Corporation is independent and, and is responsible to be able to manage its operations, and the Board of Directors is ultimately um, the ones who kind of undertake the. Um, uh, review and ensuring compliance uh, with all these obligations of uh, Canada Post management. We do kind of flag those, but obviously, given the numbers that we were provided or that we mentioned today of decrease of 600 uh, locations over the course of 30 years, uh, there are instances where, you know, locations are, are closing, unfortunately. And, and I guess my question really or my observation would be that the Government of Canada, the Department of Public Services and Procurement, who function under the Canada Post Corporation Act and are responsible for overseeing that act, really need to take a look at the, the act and the fact that we've identified that the provision of these postal services 
in rural Canada is an integral part of a universal service. I currently have a community, I'm the member of parliament in a large rural community, as I think I've stated. I have a community that is operating a Canada Post um, office out of a community hall, and they are fundraising in order to cover the costs of that service in their community. I think that's reprehensible when we're talking about a service that is supposed to be universally accessible. I, I will leave that one there. The Minister of Public Services and Procurement is expected to provide Canada Post with guidance and oversight to ensure that the overall direction and performance of the corporation aligns with the government's policies and objectives. And I know that this is normally communicated via a letter of expectation. I think we've spoken about that as well. Did the minister provide Canada Post with this annual letter this year? Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. Yes, the minister did. Okay, and you've, you've already answered that the privacy of Canadians was addressed in that letter. What other major issues were identified in the letter by the minister? As I indicated, the, the, there's a number of areas that have been identified, including uh, guidance that we received from the Privy Council Office. Um, there were some announcements in Budget 2023 um, dealing with spending reductions that are expected to be also reflected in Crown Corporations. There was language around the need to meet the service charter. And, and I'll add that uh, in addition to the rural moratorium, the service charter does include expectations that 98% of Canadians are within 15 kilometers of a post office. 88% of Canadians are within five kilometers of a post office, and 78% of Canadians are within two and a half kilometers of a post office. So it, the, the, the rules are not just simply the moratorium on the closures, but there is also the, the need to ensure that uh, there's convenient access. Um, but uh, as, as uh, MP Backrack mentioned, there is certainly an opportunity um, to look at, at the, the confines of, the, of what exists currently in the, in the rural moratorium and, and you know, examine potential changes as part of the government service charter uh, review that needs to occur um, and, and look at ways to ensure that services are protected in rural communities um, by looking at things as simple thank as... Thank you very much. That is our time. Mr. Uh, Kuzmerchuk, please, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And before I just begin my questions, I just want to ask Mr. Chair, um, when, when the premiers had appeared uh, before the OGO committee, we asked them to share with the committee correspondence that they had. Uh, with the committee prior to uh, prior to their appearance, and I just wanted to get an update whether that correspondence has been shared. Does anything come in? I'm just wondering yeah. whether we could maybe send a reminder uh, for that information to be sent to the committee. Sure, we'll also check uh, with Mr. Bigelow. As I mentioned, we have a, uh, a sub in chair today. Okay, perfect. That's great. Thank you. Um, last year, uh, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for appearing at this uh, at this committee, and thank you so much for um, for the information that you're providing. Um, last year, in, in IMO, as I understand it, uh, we had unveiled Canada Post unveiled its first all electric fleet. I think there was 14 all electric, 100% electric delivery vans uh, that were uh, unveiled. This is part of our our greening government uh, strategy uh, to electrify uh, 14,000 of the uh, of the fleet. Uh, the Canada Post fleet. I just wanted to ask whether there's been any analysis done on the potential cost savings to Canada Post of transitioning from uh, combustion engines, fossil fuel engines to uh, electric vehicle fleets. Do you anticipate cost savings? I mean, it's 14,000 vehicles. Mm -hmm. We know that electric vehicles cost less to maintain. We know the fuel costs are less as well too. Do we expect savings for Canada Post as a result of this uh, transition to electric vehicles. And I know that I believe that we've committed over a billion dollars just for Canada Post to that transition, if I'm not mistaken. Can you please maybe speak to that a little bit? Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for, for the question. So um, I know that Canada Post is exploring and doing analysis in terms of um, potentially electrifying its fleet. Again, recognizing that Canada Post has locations across Canada. And so in certain instances or in certain locations, uh, an electrification of its vehicle fleet may be um, a little bit easier and may result in cost savings compared to others where it might be a little bit more um, difficult or, or, or um, challenging from an um, uh, infrastructure uh, perspective. I do know that this is one of the things that Canada Post is looking at as part of its ongoing um, assessment of its ongoing costs and whether there may be opportunities to be able to reduce some of those costs. Again, uh, recognizing that uh, the electric electrification of a fleet would obviously happen as um, kind of the, the you know this fleet um, the current fleet um, reaches its 
its uh, end of its useful uh, life cycle, which for every vehicle will obviously be slightly uh, different. So I don't have a specific answer in terms of the number of what could be cost savings, uh, but I do know that Canada Post is exploring that um, uh, at this point in time. Okay, if you do have that information, uh, if you're able to share it with the committee subsequently, that would be terrific. I'd love to be able to see if there is a cost analysis for the potential cost savings of going to electric. Um, I also wanted to ask whether um, right now the rollout of of EVs would be taking place in, in urban areas where there is infrastructure, charging stations and, and whatnot, uh, and uh, communities are in close proximity. Do you foresee challenges uh, specific to rural uh, delivery for going to electric vehicles? Mr. Chair, for the question, um, so recognizing I'm, I'm adventuring into an area that I'm really not that familiar with, so I'm going to be fairly cautious in, in terms of my voice because this is, again, an operational question for, for Canada Post. Um, I think one of the challenges that is faced, and I'm not an EV expert, so I hope Canadians won't get upset with me if I get some of the, this wrong, but... Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, for example, in northern communities where the temperature can get a little bit um, more difficult, we know the battery life can, can have some challenges. Um, so I think... Again, recognizing that the Canada Post has 5,600 locations spread out across Canada and that they serve many different types of communities. I don't necessarily know that a one-size-fits-all approach will work in terms of the way that they manage their fleet. They'd have to be able to um, um, target that in a way that would be appropriate to be able to both have the cost associated with it but also the return on investment um, potentially. Um, you've been before this committee um, as the head of the Office of Small and Medium uh, Enterprises before. And I just wanted to ask, is the universality principle of Canada Post, is it, in your opinion, an advantage for small businesses and, and Canada can be seen as an, as an advantage to have this uh, network and this service for small businesses in Canada, just from your prior role and prior perspective? Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. Uh, yeah, recognizing I, I have been with the Office of Small and Medium, it's not called Procurement Assistance Canada, pardon me. I have been with Procurement Assistance Canada for, for a number of years now. So I think there is an advantage. Um, small businesses, dep 